frontier. This is Football Daft with Stephen Purden. Midfield dynamo and average actor. Chris Toll. Target man. Suspicious character. And... G4 trips, remember if you've been in a road traffic accident, you're not at fault. G4 claims can make it easy for me. They can provide you with a complete accident management support that you require. They'll recover the cost from the at-fault party, sort out a light-for-light vehicle replacement, and they'll also organise your vehicle to be repaired at one of their approved body shops and return to you. Should your vehicle be deemed a write-off, they will recover the pre-accident value for your car. And a big fat check for it, and best of all, it won't cost you a penny as they charge the for insurance direct. G4 claims don't cold call, they don't buy data, and once they've processed your claim, the insurance will remain unscathed. And the best thing is, Nicole and the team over there won't take their case on if they don't think that they can help. So if you've been in a road traffic accident, I know somebody that has, go on to G4 claims on 01698767172. That's 01698767172. Get them at notatfaultclaim.com or find them on social media at G4 Claims on the G4 claims. Not at all claims. claims. Me. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to Football Daft a man who has scored goals for everyone from Arsenal to Wimbledon to West Ham and to his country Wales. He moved to Scotland in 2001 and became an integral part of Mark Rennell's side, scoring one in, two, one in every two games and won three titles, two Scottish Cups and a League Cup, as well as Players Player of the Year. It's Big Bad John Hartson. What's happening, John? Thank you. I'm buzzing. All right, mate. All I'm, good. I'm, all I'm good. buzzing here. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm high as a kite, man. I'm I'm buzzing for this one. I think me and Gredo should get a day off. I don't think we're going to be in edgeways. <laughs> <laughs> this is and your day, that, Cole. This is your day. This, this is it. Finally, it's, it's all built up to this. I had mud on the cloud a few months back. Now I've got John Hartson. Brilliant. Hey, you Frank McAvaney as well. Come on. Oh, aye, uh, but we all, we, all, we all wanted to hear the shagging stories for, for Frank, didn't we? So that was a get. Did he give you any? Did he give you any? No, <laughs> no, I don't be silly. <laughs> I know, I know. He's, he's very wise, Frank. He's, he's very sensible now, isn't he? <laughs> aye. He's Where's his cards off. close to his chest? <laughs> or, or somebody else's chest, depending. <laughs> so how's things been, John? How you been getting on, mate? You been all right? Things are all right, mate. Yeah, things are okay. Um, I've got uh, my family here. I live in Edinburgh now, just outside Edinburgh. I've got uh, I've got five children, four four daughters, and my son. But um, my youngest three, um, you know, live live here with my, myself and my wife and. I think a lot of people think, you know, they think of John Hartson and they think, oh, he lives this big, extravagant, you know, lifestyle and everything else. But I very much don't. I very much don't. You know, I'm from a, a very humble background, you know, from a council estate in Swansea, like a lot of us are from council estates. Yeah. And, and I genuinely, that, that's what I like to do. I, I, I look after my family. Um, I do my work on the weekend. I've got a little bit of work this year with Sky. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I'm bringing out my own podcast uh, next week. Oh, wait a minute here, oh, hold on. Getting on. Hold the bus. This is, this, is, this is an ambush. This is just a big advert for you, Hartson, isn't it? No, it's not. I've done, I must have done about 30 podcasts during lockdown. You have? So, I've noticed that. A guy rang me last week, Grado, and he said, look, John, he said, you know, what, why don't you just do your own? And I'm like, well, I never really thought about it, but I, I think podcasts now, you know, especially with the lockdown and everything else, and People have to stay at home and, and work at home and everything else. And, you know, you can't travel big distances. And yeah. I think people are listening to podcasts now more, more than ever these days. Oh, definitely. It's, it's, I think it's taken over. See the likes of like your Saturday Night Live and maybe watching Jonathan Ross on a Friday night. People now are going on podcasts. That's where they get your, your interviews and, and they're longer. They're, you don't need to worry about telecompanies and what you're saying, any restrictions. They're a lot more natural. Aye. Yeah, yeah they it's... are. Yeah, I think... I think radio was a lot more personable anyway than, than television, mm-hmm. 100%. You know, I actually enjoy doing the, the radio actually more than being on the television, to be honest with you. My, my, my mum always said I've got face for radio anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. So how's Sky doing? How you how you getting on at Sky, mate? How's all that going? All right. Um, I've always since since I retired um, in two thousand and eight, I had my health to cope with. You know, obviously testicular cancer spread to my lungs and onto my brain, and it was something that I needed to get stronger. First of all, I needed to get through that that uh, horrendous period of my life where you know I was really under a lot of pressure at one stage. I was, I was lucky to come through because I, I'd been so ignorant of the lumps on my testicles, I allowed, my te- I allowed the cancer to spread from testicular cancer to my lungs and onto my brain. So at one stage I needed two emergency brain operations. And after that, then you go into a, a chemotherapy program. Um, you've got to get yourself stronger. You just hope then that everything stays away. Um, not, not a case of secondary and things come back and reappear. So I was very blessed in terms of being given a second bite at life, really. And it's totally changed me. It's changed me as a personality. It's just the simple things in life uh, that I, I respect and appreciate, to be honest. You know, time with my family, time with my friends. You realize who your friends are when you're going through that difficult period. Yeah. Of all the players and all the teams and the supporters I, I'd met over a 20-year career, there's probably only about four or five that were actually around my bed. And no doubt they, they, they spared, a, you know, they were thinking of me and everything else. But yeah. you do realise and you put things into perspective after that. And, and that's what I've done. It's, it's, it's changed me immensely, my experience with cancer. Brilliant. So it's kind of, it's why they want me, it obviously gives you a kind of outlook, different outlook, and you feel like you've got a second chance almost. You do feel as if, um, you know, you, you learn from the way that you were and uh, you appreciate the fact that you, you've got a second bite at it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you, you, you know, for, for, the, for a child um, to go through life and lose a parent and things like that, I was thinking how it would affect my family if I was to go, um, if I was to lose my life, how would it affect them going forward with their lives? And, you know, there's lots and lots of things and we all want to live. We've all got reasons to live and go on and have bright futures and be healthy. You know, it's the one thing that that um, that nobody wants is is a long term illness. So, you know, you look at people like, you know, lots of people like Doddy Weir at the minute, and and and, and obviously Fernando Rickson, who I played against. Really nice people, gentlemen, and 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 Doddy Weir is fighting uh, motor neurons disease, and and it took Jimmy Johnson as well uh, passed away through. You know, and, and you think to yourself, you know, you mourn about the weather and this, that and the other. And, and as I said earlier on, you, you mourn all the time, people about things. But ultimately, when you put it into perspective, if you've got your health, you know, that's, that's all you need. If you haven't got your health pretty much so, then, then you know, it's, it's, it's obviously not a nice experience. So I was very blessed to have come through my personal battle. And as you said, it's different for me. It's different now because... I, I, I don't want the extravagant stuff. I've lived a nice life. I've been able to, to travel and I've been able to play football for a living. Mm-hmm. But now it's just a case of just living ordinary and looking after my children, dropping them down at the schools in the right times. And I nip down to Wales and I nip down to my local pub in the village. And that's what I do. I, I don't mix with footballers anymore. Cause I'm not, I'm out of that circle. Well, if you know what I mean, it's to look after my family and stay healthy. That that that's all my goals are, to be honest. Right. I'm I'm really interested what you're going to do in your podcast, John. Have you got an idea? Is it all set up? Like, yeah, is it going to? What, can you tell us a wee bit about it? Because I'm interested. What is, what is great? No, it's um, it's a good excuse to do the other podcasts, isn't it? Can't have it main podcast. <laughs> it is. I, I don't know a lot about podcasts, to be honest with you, but. There's a gentleman called um, David McDonald, and David used to work for Ladbrokes. He used to be the guy that used to organise all the last Ladbrokes sponsorship and everything with the, with the, with the Scottish Premier League um, mm. and the SPL previously. Obviously, now it's the Scottish Premiership. Um, but he approached me and he basically said, look, we'll get it all set up. He says, you know, an awful lot of people... He said, why don't, we, why don't we start sort of, you know, building up a podcast for you? He says, you can get some great guests. And, and what I basically said to him was, I only want to do it if we go away from the Celtic thing. If we don't just do Celtic. Mm-hmm. Celtic players, I love Celtic. I've got a Celtic tattoo. I had a wonderful time there. Celtic is a huge part of my life. 
But I want to do this as I want to bring in Celtic um, people, Celtic guests, Rangers guests. One week I want to bring a surgeon in if he'll talk to us about about health and, cool. and everything else. I want to maybe even take a man off the streets and just talk to him, see where he is, see what he's up to, because that's the type of person I am. I'd rather listen to a man off the street who's had a difficult time lately than listen to a superstar, to be honest, because I'm not really overly, you know, into stars and everything else. So I've met I, I, totally, I totally yeah. agree with that. I've always yeah. said like, podcasts, I want to talk to a binman. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What's your life as a bin man? And tell you, and how do you fit watching fit in? And what do, you, what's, what do you have for your lunch? I love all that stuff. Uh, Greg, the, the, bins the, bins get, the bins get collected in the morning and the football's on at night. <laughs> so I, know, I, mean, I mean, I want to know somebody that's done it all their days and the stories that they've had with bins. Just wee random things like that. that sounds... we, get, we, we, get, we, we get a lot of the football stories, don't we? We've heard a lot Aye. of them. We've heard yeah. them after dinner talks and hospitality lunches, we've all been, and they're great, don't get me wrong, they're enjoyable, they're good fun, but I just wanted it to be not so much about me, because mm -hmm. my story's out there, it's been out there a million times, you know, just about, I, I want to give something back, and with, with, the, with the people that I know, and, and the characters that I've met, um, you know, for instance, my first guest, I'll tell you, but my first guest on Tuesday is Jackie McNamara, yeah. simply because... Jackie's doing all right. Yeah, he's doing okay, actually. So um, we're doing it on Tuesday. Obviously, we'll have to record it, and then the, the guys will edit it. I don't know when it will be showing and everything else. But Jackie's a great guest for me because I've roomed with Jackie at Celtic. Um, we both, you know, recently, Jackie, more so than me, has, has had his health problems as well, and he's come out of it with flying colours. He's doing Good. well again now. Good. You know, he had a testimonial at Celtic. He was let down by Gordon Strachan when Gordon Strachan sold him to Wolves and he brought in Paul Telfer. So there's, there's lots of things I can ask Jackie, but more so than anything else, I'm, I'm just going to ask him how he is. Right. How he's getting on, how was his wife, how was his children and all this sort of stuff, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And again, that takes it away from football. I know we're both footballers and there's football fans out there, Celtic fans will want to know the football stories. We'll touch on that. But more so, I want it to be um, more personal and let the guests just talk away. Just ask them a question. It's going to be difficult because, as you know, I like talking. <laughs> 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 just let the guests talk. And that's why I think it'll be more interesting than anything else. I'm just taking it away from the Celtic and the football and the Arsenal and the West Ham, all this sort of stuff. Because life, to me, football was a huge part of my life. But you go into training at nine o'clock in the morning and you finish at one. So that's four hours a day. Aye. What do you do for the other 20? <laughs> yes. go, to, go, to cruise and, go to cruise and get yourself some new Prada gear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But all joking aside, it's like 20 hours of the, the day you've got to live. Aye. Aye. And then you've got to, you've got to obviously organise your home. You've got to be happy where you are. The children play a big, massive role. All these things, football, obviously then that's every day, but the other 20 hours of the day, people tend to look at you, oh, you're a footballer, you train, you've got a great life. But if your life mm -hmm. isn't right, when you finish away from the training ground and you're training, then the pitfalls yeah. are there. The bookies are there. 100%, you right? know, the pubs, the uh, great old, the pubs are there. Yeah. The bad characters are there. You know, the, the hangers ons. Everybody are there. wants to hang on to you, man. If you're Everybody you wants a piece place. of you. I am got I am got a Welsh I am got a Welsh jersey to my name. I won fifty one caps. Mm -hmm. I've given them all away. Aye, aye. I've got a son now who's asking me for a shirt. I've got to say I am got a shirt. So mm -hmm. during my career I give it all away. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just saying because I'm not really I don't really have things up anyway, you know, pictures yeah, of shirts and everything else that they're all hanging up in Swansea and bars and pubs and everything else but um it's it must have been difficult for you John so obviously like back like touching on your career like you were like when you went to Arsenal for Luton you were the most expensive teenager at that time mm -hmm. weren't you yeah yeah how did how did you cope with all that like I, I was in a bubble mate I was in a bubble um and I always say to young players now I, I try and say to them look Take everything in, everything you do, 
every game you play, every experience, take it in and embrace it and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Because it happened to me so quickly. Uh, at 19, I became you know, a, a, a teenage sensation. I went to Arsenal for record money, two of Britain's most expensive teenagers. Mm-hmm. How many teenagers in Britain play football? Exactly. And I was worth the most. Yeah. You know? And then I went to West Ham for big money. Then I went to Wimbledon for record money. Then I came to Celtic for £6 million. So then big price tags followed me around everywhere else. And with big price tags become big pressure and big headlines. You see, know, with, because, see, you know, see with those uh, big signing on fees, could you not buy back some of the jerseys and get your laddie one of them? <laughs> <laughs> I could probably get hold of one, mate. I know what you're saying. That's, that's a nice thought, nice thing to say. I could probably get hold of one if I needed to. My son's doing all right. He doesn't go without, you know. But um, as I said, it's just, you know, things I used to do, boots and buy tickets for friends to come into grounds and, uh, and this and that. And it, it just puts it into perspective now when I've been living in Edinburgh for four years and I'm, I've been retired about 11 years. And you just wonder, you, your phone doesn't ring quite as often anymore. Uh, but it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because I think sometimes you can have too many friends. I've got 2,000 um, numbers in my phone, but there's probably about five or six in there that I could really say, do you know what? Spend a bit of time with him. I really like him. I trust him. And trust for me is second only to health. You've got to trust. If you're going to go on with somebody as a mate and everything else, trust to me has always been, you know, the, the, the number one, number two thing after my health. Where there's no trust, there's nothing, you know? Well, that's, that's, a big a, part, that's a big part of your career as well. What trust that you've played under a lot of a lot of managers, obviously throughout your career, John. Mm-hmm. Um, did did you have that trust in George Graham when he brought you into Arsenal? Well, what happened with George, strangely enough, was um, George signed me, and then and then obviously I, I I started to play with Ian Wright, who was the England centre forward, and then George got the sack after mm-hmm. about a month because he took. He took a little bit of a backhander off a, off a Swedish agent, I think, or a Norwegian agent. Right. Um, and he lost his job because of that. And uh, apparently he gave the money back. So if he's going to get the sack, what's the point of giving the money back? You'd have kept it, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so George was sort of a short spell, really. I didn't really get to know George that well, although he signed me for the football club. George Graham's a legend at Arsenal. I think he's one of only two men that have won the double as a manager and a player at mm-hmm. Arsenal. A great disciplinarian, Scotsman. Um, so I didn't get to know George that well. And then it was um, Bruce Rioch for a what? spell. And then I worked under Arsene Wenger, who was just, um, he was just phenomenal, Arsene Wenger, the way that he just changed everything and, um, and, and made the players... Jesse got that little bit extra out of the senior players as well, the Tony Adamses and the, nice. the Steve Bowles, the Martin Keowns, the David Siemens. They will tell you now that, that, you know, just listening and adapting to what Arsene Wenger was, was, was trying to teach them, they did that. They tuned in and they say themselves now that Arsene Wenger put two or three years on top of their careers at that particular time when they were almost on their way out. But Wenger coming in, you know, give them a new lease of life, you know. John, I want to ask you, because we're going to be talking about Celtic, but you probably, as you say, you've been doing loads of podcasts through lockdown and you've probably covered it a million times. But take me back to when you turned up at Ibrox in the Wimbledon top. Um, I remember it as a wee guy. I remember being buzzing. I remember looking at the paper going, this will be a great signing. Yep, same. Um, I was shiting myself. Do you remember? Just like I, I, was, I was shiting myself, man. Aye, it was, it was just, I, I was so excited that we were going to sign Big Bad John Hartson and then what happened? What happened was I was, um, I didn't have a favourite Scottish team. I'd only been to Scotland once in my life and that was on a pre-season tour with, with Harry Redknapp and West Ham. 1997, we played in uh, a, a testimonial at Ibrox, lost 3-0 and we played Celtic as well. Um, at the time, and that's the only time I'd ever been to Scotland ever in my life. And I had no allegiances at the time. I was playing for Wales, 
And uh, Mark Hughes came to see me, the Welsh manager. He says, John, I think I'm going to have to leave you out this weekend of our game. We were playing Estonia away, which I thought not a bad game trip to miss anyway. <laughs> the log away, Estonia. And he said to me, yeah, we've had a telegram coming to the hotel that Rangers have bid £6 million for you and uh, they'd like to sign you. And so David Murray is sending his private jet down to Cardiff Airport. You've got to go and get yourself ready. Um, you know, we'll allow you to miss the game this weekend for us. This, this is your career. All the best. Now, for my dad, who was on 30 miles down the road in Swansea, my dad made his way up to Cardiff. We got a taxi into the airport. And then it was the private jet. Uh, we flew up to Glasgow. Uh, we're in Glasgow in 40 minutes. I was met with a load of press at Glasgow Airport. I think I was um, equal in what they'd spent for Ronald de Boer. Um, Ronald de Boer was actually signing on the same day. So we take it into Ibrox and um, I'm walking down the side of the tunnel and I'm getting ready to sign for Rangers. I'm playing for Wimbledon at the time. Also, I'm with the Welsh team, but Wimbledon was my club team. And uh, Ronald's on the, he's in the centre circle in the middle of the pitch with his Rangers scarf like that. So I've gone, Ronnie, Ronnie. And he's looked over and I've said, give me two minutes. We, we'll do it together. Right. We'll pose together for the pitchers or whatever it is. So he said, yeah, no problem, great, you know. So I was up the tunnel, I walked in the dressing room to the left, and um, Konchelskis was there, I'll bet, uh, Bomber Brown, and they're all high five, you know, what a sign, we can't wait to get you on board, John, and everything else. So then I get ushered off uh, to go for a, for a medical. Um, I had one scan on my knee, and then I come straight back. I think he was in Ross Hall somewhere in Glasgow yeah. City yeah. Centre. I had a scan. I was half an hour away um, in the car. We've got the scans. And then I would also agreed with Sir David Murray upstairs in one of his offices, uh, a five-year contract. Uh, I'm signing. All I had to do was pass this medical. So then um, I got to the hospital, did my scan, x-ray, everything else. And I'm, I'm with Dick Artecat in, uh, in one of the offices downstairs, away from David Murray's big sort of office and everything else, and all these mahogany chairs and the big table, the chairman's office, of course. Mm -hmm. So I go downstairs, I'm sitting with Dick Advocat, and uh, we've got the contract there, and I'm just waiting. <clears throat> and his, Dutch, um, his fellow Dutch doctor came in, and he said, look, I'm really sorry, Mr. Advocat. He said we can't do the deal. So Dick Advocates, what, what, what are you talking about? You know, John's here, he's ready to sign. Um, and then they just basically pulled the plug. They said, we can't do the deal because there's something showed up on John's knee um, that we believe, you know, he wouldn't get through what we need him to get through in terms of the training and the games. And I was 26 years of age, prime of my life in terms of my career. Scoring goals, you know, down south, representing my country. And I had Man United talking about me. I had other clubs I could have, you know, been interested with. And then within 10 minutes, I, I am back on the plane and I'm back down to Cardiff. And I, I basically failed the medical at Rangers because of, of, of a knee. Um, and then I'm, I'm not being, uh, a lot of people have said to me over the years, oh, John, they got you up there. That, that was just a publicity stint. It was this, it was that. And I genuinely believe that it wasn't. I think I genuinely believe that the, the physio come back, the Dutch doctor, and he must have saw something in, in the knee that sort of prevented them going on and, and doing the deal. Um, did, they never, did they never show you what it was or anything no, like that? No, they never, never showed me nothing like that. And what was, what was a little bit pleasing for me was I went on from there six months later I did a pre-season in St Andrews with Coventry uh, with Gordon Strachan and, and what was pleasing for me more than anything else from a personal point of view was I went on to make 220 appearances then for Celtic mm -hmm. uh, Martin only signed me for six million pounds I flew the medical and I made 220 appearances I played more games for Celtic than what Ronald De Boer did for Rangers I scored more goals than Ronald did at Rangers for the same money. And um, I, I never missed a game. I never missed a training session because of this so-called bad knee. Um, and the Celtic fans used to say to me, as they would, when you score, John, run to the corner 
and rub your knee to the fans. That will cause the riot. But <laughs> I, I, I never went, I never did that. I never did that because I just wanted to just, by scoring and by playing, was enough to say, well, you got that one wrong, you know. Um, but what, what, what is unusual as well, not so much unusual, but what I try and say is, is that, you know, I would have been a Rangers player because mm. I, I had nothing against them, you know, during that particular time. Um, I, I had no allegiances to Celtic. I hadn't experienced an old firm game. And I would have signed for Glasgow Rangers had they, you know, pursued with the medical. But, um, you know, that upsets one or two Celtic fans. But it, it's common sense. Yeah. If I hadn't had any interest from Celtic and I got the goal and I, I had no allegiances again. So, right. but, you know, sometimes you just think things happen for a reason. And maybe it just, maybe it just wasn't what meant to be. It's one of those things. But that is the gospel truth. And uh, that's exactly uh, in detail how, how things panned out. Like, when you move to Celtic and you see Larson's there and Sutton's there, mm. how daunting is that for you? Were they two there already? And you know you need to fight for a place to get in there. Well, how the year I got there, 2001, they, they, they just previously won the treble. Aye. Mm -hmm. And Henrik and Chris uh, had formed up this unbelievable partnership and they, they yeah. won the treble. Yeah. And I think they scored 66 goals between them, you know? And I've got to go in there mm -hmm. and upset the apple cart I'm one of the record signings. I think the record signing was 6.5. I think there was a couple of us that were six. And I haven't come to sit on the bench. I haven't come to mess about here. I want to play. And for the first five or six games, um, Celtic did very well. They were winning. And I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to get in this team? But um, luckily for me, Chris Sutton and his professionalism and his, um, you know, the, he, was, he was such a great professional, great player. Chris this one, he, he said it was okay for him to go and play in midfield and play at, 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 in the defence. And once I got in the team, I never came out. <clears throat> I never came out for five years. I had two back operations. But um, I was a constant player in that team. And I always say maybe with, with Hearts and Larson and Sutton in the one team, we're, always very, we're obviously much stronger than one of us sitting on the bench. Well, Henrik was never going to be sub and Chris either, really. But um, Chris was, um, you know, he, he could play in a number of positions, really. Um, he had a great engine. And um, you know, luckily for me, he, he said that, fine, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for John. Let John and Henrik play, and I'll drop into midfield just off the front, or I'll go and play centre-back. And we had a great spell. We had a great spell together at Celtic, as you know, the UEFA Cup final, and and all the trophies and everything else. Um, and it was a brilliant, brilliant part of my life. But it was daunting, but I had to get in straight to, I had to get in the team. And luckily, I, Martin O'Neill, who believed in me, which gave me that chance. Right. Aye, you caused me a few heartbreaks earlier, years, John. I won't lie. Oh, horrible shame. <laughs> yeah, horrible shame. I had a good run, to be fair. <laughs> I had a really good run against Reeds. I think I scored the winning goal in four consecutive games. Oh, That's I remember. Great. I remember, yeah. mate. I remember. Yeah. So, and it's just one of those things where you hit it right. off. And, and you know what it's like. If you, Those are the games that you adhere yourself to the crowd. Right. You know, those are the games where... And it's not just Glasgow. It, it's, it's everywhere. It's Ireland. It's North America. It's New York. It's Canada. You know, Celtic and Rangers fans all over the world. You know, clubs and everything else. So when you win them games, they're a nightmare when you lose them. You don't want to get your head off the pillow. But when you win them, everybody feels it. Not just the players, the managers, the staff, the kit man, the tea lady, the supporters, the supporters abroad that, that tuned in. I think it's, it's shown in over 300 countries, you know, this particular game, Celtic Rangers. Um, so when you get the winning goal, it's obviously very pleasing. And that's, that's why at that particular time, and even now, um, I have a great affinity with, with the Celtic fans. Right. John, you see how you were talking earlier about you have a wee bit of regret about how you looked after yourself when you played. Did you talk talk us talk to us about that? Like, what this was, is, this what is was, great. What I love talking about stuff like this when it comes into yeah. folk being unfit. <laughs> Not that I'm saying you were unfit, right? But yeah. what you could have done better. Like, I know I will always look back on my wrestling career and going, I should have got in a good nick, but I never did. Mm. So but Gredo, see if you take that away for you. 
No, you're taking away a lot of your character. No, I know, no, it, I know that, I know that, I know that. But it's still won't he stop me for later on life going, why did I not just put a nails in the gym and watch my diet and stuff like that? And it, it's good to hear for somebody else that you know you, you said yourself you wish you looked looked, looked after yourself better. Well, well, first and foremost, I was fit. I was fit. Aye. You had to be fit, otherwise I wouldn't have survived. I wouldn't have played the games. And you've got to be fit to play in Gordon Strachan's teams because Gordon, Gordon played till he was 39 and he based his emphasis on his players with, with fantastic fitness. So I was fit. Um, but if I'd have gone through my career a stone and a half lighter and I'd really knuckled down, done extra, watched my food, watched my drinking, because I loved the pint. I loved the pint with the lads and, um, and everything else. I, and, and, and nowadays, dr- players don't drink. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they go and have a couple oh, of shots or whatever else. But it's maybe where I came from, Grado, because I'm from that area where I collected glasses in my local social club for a fiver on a Friday and Saturday night. My mum and dad be playing bingo. Or my, you know, and at the end of the night, my mum be having, you know, my mum would play bingo. My dad would be in the bar, and the only the only time they'd see each other was at the end of the night in the hall for a slow dance. <laughs> you have all the boys, all you have all the men in the bar, and you have all the women in the hall. You know, and and the, the men would come in to watch the show and everything else. And that's why I, I'm a little bit old school in that sense. Mm-hmm. You know, when I go to a bathgate or whenever I go, and I go to social clubs and everything. I'm in my oils there. That's what I like because that's the way I was brought up. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the little pool table in the corner, jukebox, everything else. That, that was me. Right. Rather than going to a nightclub, it's so much better. And then it just sitting with the old, yeah. sitting with the audience, getting a pint and talking away and talking about the news I, and all I, that. I, I, that's I, the I best did, times. I done a right in nightclubs. I, you know, I, I, I went a few times. You know, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I didn't miss out on anything. I've got to say that. Uh, but when I when I say that, you know, I just think I just think maybe maybe tuning in a little bit more and and obviously appreciating where I was, you know, and the level of career and the level of teams and the games I was playing. I was playing Champions League football. That is for the elites, you know. I played for Arsenal, double winners, and West Ham with Rio Ferdinand, and these guys playing for Wales with Giggs and Bellamy and Hughes and Russian. So I was at the elite level. I, I reached the peak of my career, 51 caps senior level for my, for my, uh, for my country. But I, I still believe in, in my own mind, if, if I tuned in and just looked after myself, maybe not gone for that pint, maybe being a bit, a bit lighter, um, I could have got around a bit more. I could have jumped higher. I could have lasted longer in games where Martin was bringing me off after 75 minutes because I was done and I'd already scored a couple of goals anyway. So he was quite pleased. I could have just gone on. And that's when I say that. But, you know, let's not, let's not, let's not get away, kind of away and think that I was unfit and I couldn't score goals and I couldn't get across people. You look at my videos that sell like 110 goals. You don't score that amount of goals. If you're I've unfit. never got the math. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fit, but I just, it's just myself. Um, right. I just feel I could have gone a bit higher. Gone. Uh, you were responsible for my ma winning hundreds and hundreds of money, right? Because she used to, like, touching on what Grado says, she, she used to say, I just love big hearts, and he's just a big cuddly guy. I just love him. So she would put 20 quid on you every week for the first goal, right? Mm-hmm. And honest to God, I ain't, I ain't down to you. I've had a few holidays and stuff like that, mate. <laughs> so, it's, it, like, you were, you were kind of like a, a, a housewife's favourite kind of thing, yeah, when yeah. you were at Celtic as well. You must have got some offers along the way, surely. <laughs> <It's steady>. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's got to watch this, you know. But um, No, as I said, you know, I, I was just very normal, very normal, and a decent fella, five kids now. And uh, as I said, you know, I, I don't have an enemy, really. I'm supposed this, you know, people say to me, John, who did you dislike? Who, who do you really hate? And I, I don't really hate anybody. I really don't. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, football is, I appreciate, you know, both sides, Celtic and Rangers, you know, there's a lot of rivalry, there's a lot of passion. Wouldn't go as far as saying hatred, I would just say, you know, passionate and, you know, that goes years, years and years gone by, you know, goals and, and winning games and this player and that player were favourites, they weren't so much favourites, they kicked somebody, 
they left a bit on that player when he was there and that. You're always going to get that, but I, I do enjoy the rivalry. Uh, a lot of, I've, got, I've got a lot of good mates, great who've done work for my charity, always turns out to be a great supporter of the John Artson Foundation. I've got good mates who are Rangers fans, uh, you know, and they often say to me, John, you know, you're a good lad. We can go out with the wives and have a nice meal, but you, you do appreciate on Saturday when, when, we, when we're playing against you, I'm going to give you pelters for 90 minutes. <laughs> no. And I'm like, well, fine, I can appreciate that. But... Uh, <laughs> That's what it's all about, though, man. That's what you need. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I remember sitting at a table at John Hartson's uh, golf night. You're sitting, Neil Lennon on one side and the goalie Andy Gorham on the other. We're all just talking away. It's brilliant. I love what right. I carry on here on the story. It's back and forth. That's the way it should be, yeah. I think it's charity. It's whenever there's a funeral, God bless the people that we've lost, you know. I remember Tom, um, uh, the, the great... Um, Billy McNeil um, and everything else, and some of the Lisbon Lions, you know, they used to, they used to, they, they, I think, and the same with um, uh, Walter Smith, Ali McCoy, you know, John Gregg, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they carried um, Jimmy Johnson's funeral in from, from the, the cortege, mm -hmm. you know, outside Celtic Park. And, you know, I think when it comes to charity or someone's life, then I think football becomes secondary, you know? Absolutely. See, touching on, touching on uh, getting back to what you were saying about you're doing your podcast now, John. Um, you've, yeah. been, you've been doing a bit of punditry for a while now. Um, mm. it, me, personally, as a Celtic fan, I, I quite like listening to you because you tend to see the positives, right? But there's a lot of ex-Celtic players who do punditry that don't seem to have a good word to say about the club. Can you... Is there... Is he, Obviously, you're not going to uh, divulge any information or anything like that. But when you're when you're given that role, is there anybody that comes into your ear and says, "Listen, you need to touch on these points" or anything like that? And and it does tend to. I, I think the boys will probably uh, agree as well. Grado and Stephen, there's there's pundits that do it in the, the other direction as well. But I tend to find people like Andy Walker and Chris Sutton. Uh, sorry, not Chris Sutton. Uh, Chris Commons are really negative towards Celtic at times. And I don't know whether they've right got an axe to grind. Games. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they've got an axe to grind with the club. But, uh, maybe how their careers ended there. But it's what 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 do you think it is that that makes this come out of these people? I don't know. I can't really speak for Andy Walker. And you know, Sky appoints him. Andy's been working at Sky now for a long time. Chris Commons, I think he still has a column, but I don't think he does a lot of Sky these days. Um, but I can only speak for myself and. You know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm if I'm doing a Celtic Rangers game, which I've done, I've done many of them, and there's a there's a you know there's a, a blatant penalty. Say, for instance, Rangers, and I say that's not a penalty. Then I've got my producer in my ears saying, what what bleeding game are you watching, John? That's <laughs> not good for me. And I think the genuine Celtic football people that are watching the game at home will also go, John's bang on there. Chris Sutton does it very well. John's right there. That was a penalty. And I think sometimes when you duck out of them decisions, it goes against you. Because the Celtic mm. fans, they see through that, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So first and foremost, you, you've got to call it as you see it. Um, yes, my allegiances are with Celtic. Chris Boy's allegiances will be with Rangers. Ali McCoy's allegiances. But when you're doing a game, you've got to be honest. And you've got to call it as you see it. Um, mm. You know, I, I've got massive respect for Celtic. I love the supporters. I can't go anywhere in the world without meeting any supporters. And I don't think you last. I don't think you last, especially on the television, if, um, if, if you're not sort of down the middle and calling games as you see them, you know. And people know. People know who you support. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the companies try and balance out the studio. They try and put a Celtic and a Rangers man in there to balance things out and to balance the, you know, the the commentary and the debates out and things like this. So I can only speak for myself and I try and call it as it is. I've been doing a lot of media work now. I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing it because I've got other things that, I, you know, I might be looking at doing this. I think we all get a shelf life in, in certain things. And um, there's younger uh, pundits coming through. There's, there's editors changing. There's producers changing. There's players retiring from football. They all want my job, you know, they're articulate, they do their prep, they're good looking, 
Go on, yeah. we're, we're exactly the same. Yeah, it changes. <laughs> and I think, you, I think you've got to evolve sometimes. Do you know what I mean? You've got to evolve. You've got to have something, you know, in the background that if that stops, you can move into that and it all doesn't finish there. And yeah. I'm starting to be at that position now, to be honest. I've done an awful lot of traveling. For the last 13 years, I've done some big shows for the BBC, for Satanta, for um, BT Sport, and I'm still doing a little bit with Sky and the radio, this and that and the other. But I just think I'm 45 and I've been doing it a long time. I don't know if I want to be doing media when I'm 50. You know, mm. so who knows what's around the corner, do you know? Aye. Definitely, man. That's what I was going to say. We, we, we kind of feel the same way. I mean, we've been doing this podcast for nearly a year now together, and there's people just starting up their own podcasts willy nilly, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> <laughs> feels like everybody right. wants their job, John. I, I, just want to, I just want to take part. I don't want to take over. <laughs> just, I'm not being rude. I'm really enjoying this, but I get my kids at half past three. Yeah, right. right. So right. I, can do, I can do a couple more, and then i got to get out of the house. My wife's right. in class. tell you. I tell you what we'll do it then. I'm here on my own, my little fella. Here she is. Oh, oh you get one as well. Be you I got two more questions. Right, I tell you, I tell you what we'll do then. I tell you what we'll do then, John. Every week we do a quiz. Right, John. So every week on Football Daft, we want to put our guests' football knowledge to the test with our 90 second quiz. Okay. And after last week we have a, well, we've got a new leader on the board. It's John Sutton, who's on 15. We've got Mark Wilson, Keith Lasley, they're tucked in behind with 14. The good doctor, Kenny Duker and Harper, are just behind in third place with 13. Other selected scores include Barry Ferguson on 12, Murdo McLeod on 10, Marvin Andrews on 5, and Falkirk manager David McCracken still at the bottom with 1. Is there anybody there you want to beat? I want to beat them all, but I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> right, mate, so we've got 90 seconds, right? You can't pass, you must give an answer, OK? Right, producer John's on 90 seconds on the clock. There is. Right, here we go, John. Who is the current manager of Hearts? Uh, Robbie Nielsen. Aaron Hickey signed for which Italian club? Oh, uh, he signed for Perugia. Who currently sits top of the Scottish Premiership? Rangers. Who did you score your 100th Celtic goal against? Okay. Name one of John McGinn's footballing brothers. I know. Played for Hibs. Uh, Paul. What league are Stenhouse Muir currently in? Uh, Scottish Division League One. Who is the current manager of Swansea City? Uh, that would be uh, Cooper. How many goals did you score for Coventry? Six. Who do the Shire share a stadium with? Oh, Oldham. Name two of the three sides who have started the English Premiership season with three wins out of three. Time. I'll let you answer it though, John. So say it again. Name two of the three sides who have started the English Premiership season with three wins out of three. Everton. And um, well, she's done it. What about Pool and Leicester? <laughs> you, you only Everton had to give Leicester. <laughs> you only had to give one. You got it oh, right. Oh, I didn't have to give two. Think you two to you. Oh done. fuck! Sorry. Aye. <laughs> no, How many no did I get? Pals act there. Not I mean. No pals act. You know what I mean? How many did I get? <laughs> Right, John. Right. right. Wrong answers. Uh, Stennis Muir currently in League Two. The Shire Shea Stadium with Falkirk. And we'll give you a half point for the last one. So, uh, seven and a half points, John. Well done, John. Well done. That's not too bad, man. Bad. John, thanks for picking your time up and coming on. I really appreciate Bye. it. Cheers, John. All the best. All the best, John. Good catch up with you, mate. Thanks very much. Yeah, pal. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Football is a short career, but what if we could give our favourite ex-pros one last go around? Yeah, what if we could give them one last match? Which of the former teammates would they want in their side alongside them? Who would they want on the bench screaming the instructions? And which of the famous stadiums they played at would they like to walk out at one more time? Yeah, they're the kind of questions that we put the likes of, well, Jason McAteer. I finished my career and there's, there's always that feeling I had that I always wish I'd won something with Liverpool. Great team, 
great bunch of lads. We should have won the Premier League. We should have won a, a trophy. John Hartson. So I, I think back and I think, you know, I, I probably, I've never got over that, you know, losing that night. Emil Heskey. Going to Birmingham and it just wasn't the same. You know, everything was sideways and backwards because everyone was a bit too, mm -hmm. they wasn't confident enough in their ability to actually hit that pass. Mm -hmm. But Steve had just gone around and bang, yeah, bang. And loads more. Season one is coming soon to YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple's iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, subscribe now and see why it's never too late for one last match. Audio Frontier.